Welcome everybody to the Old Household. My name is Wes. I'm one of the pastors at Grace Church. And aren't you glad today that the church is not about buildings that we sit in, but words that we live by and a Savior named Jesus we live for. It is good to be together and I'm so thankful for my mom introducing today's message. I love you, mom. I'm so grateful on this Mother's Day that you're my mom. And I wanna let all moms and grandmas and foster moms and aunts and influencers, women of God, in the family of God, for all, I wanna thank you for all of the care and spiritual guidance that you provide young people and uh, frankly, children and adults of all ages as they catch the faith from you and through your very lives. We're grateful for you today. Well, on June 21st, 1999, after eight hours of excruciating labor, because my wife Becky was squeezing my hand, our son Caleb was born. And that was of course just an awesome, awesome day in our life. And my parents made their way from out of town to come and visit their first grandchild. And as I was holding my son Caleb, I'll never forget what my mom said when she walked into the room. As she saw me there holding my newborn son, she looked at me square in the eye and with a twinkle in her eye, she said, now you'll know, now you'll know. And I looked at her and I said, no what mom? And she just laughed and she said, oh, now you'll know. That phrase has stayed with me now for almost 21 years. Uh, now I know, I think a little bit about what she was trying to communicate with me all those years ago, because now I know another level of unconditional love for another person. That kind of sparked in my heart the moment that I met my son, Caleb. Now I know another level of joy as well as heartache. Now I know what I put my own parents through as I was growing up. Uh, now I know a bunch of soul deep emotions that I never knew before my son was born. Now I know what God himself must experience as God has got a planet full of his children and he longs to be in a relationship with each one of us. Yes, now I know and parents, you know what I'm talking about today. Well, in the series, Bless This Mess, we are praying that every person we reach will know and experience the love of Jesus Christ. We are praying that you'll have this experience down deep in your soul, that you would know that you are a child of God and a person of worth. One of the best descriptions that I've ever heard of God is that God is like a perfect, loving parent who just seeks to be in a healthy relationship with all of his children. That's who God is. God is love and that love is best known as we seek to love children. God loves us, his very children. And God wants to bless you today, uh, even if and even when your life is a mess. That's the unconditional, unearned, unmerited grace and favor of God. Over the last few weeks, we've experienced God's love as we've talked about how Jesus comes to restore our relationship with God. Jesus offers us the forgiveness and the grace that we need to be united with God, our Heavenly Father, that perfect parent yet again. And then that relationship so fills our lives that it can spill out onto other people. And all of our relationships can be uh, affected by this and influenced by God's love flowing through us. So we've talked about how God wants to bless our families. God wants to bless our friendships. God wants to bless our marriages. And today we're gonna to be talking about how God wants to bless our parenting. Yes, even if and when that parenting is a mess. Because let's admit behind the photo filters and the Facebook and Instagram posts, sometimes parenting is very messy and it's difficult to be in relationship with one another. Now, while we're focusing on parenting today, let me remind us that all of us in the family of God, all of us in the family of God have a responsibility for one another, including children and students and young adults. The Apostle Paul was an unmarried leader in the first century church and he had no children. Yet in his 13 letters that he wrote to different faith communities, different churches, he includes in those 13 letters 277 references uh, using family language. He even says in one of his letters, uh, it's called Galatians, that he writes to those younger in the faith and addresses them this way. He says, my dear spiritual children. 
See, he even compares the anguish when they act immaturely as his own labor pains, if you will. So if you're not a parent, grandparent or foster parent with responsibilities of a child in your own home, then you can find a spiritual child at Grace Church who needs you to adopt them in the faith and to encourage them along the way, much like the Apostle Paul did for so many throughout his life. I'm grateful for the dozens of you who love my son Caleb and still do today as he has uh, just finished his sophomore year of college. Thank you all for standing in the gaps and coming alongside of us to encourage him in the faith. And he's walking with Jesus today. Praise God. Since there are no perfect parents on earth, we need each other. I needed you and you stepped up to the plate. So many of you. And we all need help from one another and we need help from God. Because one of the things that I've discovered, uh, one of the things now I know, is that when it comes to being a parent, then and even now, I know now I'm so, I was so, and am so ill-equipped. Um, I had parents that loved me and sought to raise me in the faith, but uh, even that was not enough for me to understand how to parent. I've read a lot of books, I went to a lot of seminars, I've had a lot of mentors to help me along the way, and yet still I find I mess up sometimes as a dad. So that's why we need God's grace. That's why we need one another. Now I know that I don't know what I'm doing, even today as a parent of a young adult. This is probably why I love reading the Bible so much, because the Bible is full of honest, uh, messy people who don't have it all together, and they don't hide their shortcomings from us or from God. And when they turn to God for help, we find these heroes in the faith, uh, even as imperfect parents, find that Jesus is there for them. And today we're going to look at an Old Testament story, and we're going to ask God for help for more about our parenting, that we might honor God in our parenting, no matter if we have children living at home or in the family of God. 1 Samuel chapter 1 uh, is where we're going to focus our attention today, and in that chapter we meet a woman who doesn't have children, and yet she desperately longs to have a child. Now, some of you know that longing very much so even today as you watch this. Well, for Hannah, uh, that's her name. We're going to see that her life was not neat and tidy. Uh, her story is difficult. Um, her husband was a guy by the name of Elkanah, and he had another wife, get this, he had another wife alongside Hannah, and her name was Panina. Uh, Panina was his second wife. Yes, Elkanah, this guy had two wives. He missed last week's sermon on marriage, it, it appears. Uh, polygamy, in fact, was practiced during these Old Testament times. And thankfully, as their understanding and knowledge of God grows, you can see that begin to diminish. But at this time, polygamy is still practiced mainly for economic reasons. But as you might expect, inside this little dysfunctional family unit, that only made things a lot worse because Elkanah, this guy, Elkanah's two wives were not exactly best friends forever. In fact, they were rivals because uh, Panina had children while Hannah did not. And so you can see this could cause a major problem problem. And to not have children in those days, to be barren meant that you failed the family. And they falsely thought that this was somehow a reflection of a person's relationship with God, that somehow God was punishing them. Again, let me just say, as we begin to look into this lady Hannah's story, her life is a mess. So let's pick up the story as it's told in 1 Samuel 1, verses 3 through 8. When we get to verse 8, you're going to see something amazing about how clueless and egotistical Hannah's husband is, but here we go. Let's dive in. Each year, Elkanah would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of Heaven's armies at the tabernacle. The priests of the Lord at that time were the two sons of Eli, Hopni and Phinehas. On the days Elkanah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Penana and to each of her children. Although he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. So Panina would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Year after year, it was the same. Panina would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. Now check this out. 
Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than ten sons? <laughs> yes, that's right. Can you believe this story is in the Bible? This husband doesn't get it. Elkanah's a piece of work, isn't he? And yes, you read that correctly. On their way to worship, Hannah is being taunted by her rival wife. And when they go and they make the sacrifice and then they sit down for a ceremonial sacrificial meal, uh, her not having children is just rubbed in her face because they would pass out meat according to uh, the size of the different families. And so she would only get one portion of meat while her rival wife got plenty for her children. Uh, this failure of to have children was just rubbed in her face. Their journey from uh, their home to the tabernacle was about 15 miles. So Penina had a lot of time to taunt Hannah while Elkanah just stood by and did nothing. And of course, his only attempt at comfort were these outrageous narcissistic words. Why be so upset, dear? You have me. <laughs> this guy is clueless, isn't he? I'm sure this did little to help Hannah's broken heart. And yet this dysfunctional family in our Bible story for today at least had one thing going for them. They did one thing right. In the story, we see it repeated that uh, every year, year after year, they went to the tabernacle to worship the Lord of Heaven's armies. They went to the tabernacle to worship. This was a part of their practice, even though they were messed up as a family, they didn't let their dysfunction keep them from seeking God. And here's the good news. God heard the cry of Hannah's heart. God hears the cries of our heart as well. Look with me again as the story continues in verses 9 through 11. Once after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli the priest was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. And Hannah was, get this, in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. Now remember, Hannah was usually a basket case when it came time to go to the tabernacle to worship and especially the sacrificial meal. However, this year she did something different. She went back in uh, to pray and she poured out her heart uh, to the Lord so much so that Eli the priest uh, actually thought that she must be intoxicated or something because she, her lips were moving and yet no words were coming out. She was just in anguish and she poured her heart out to the Lord and in her prayer she makes a promise. She vows that if God would give her a son, she would give her son back to God. And since Jewish people at that time believed that anything that was not cut belonged to the Lord, she vowed that she would never cut his hair. So Hannah is desperate. And in her prayer, she literally says, let's make a deal, God. If you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. Now, what, what's going on here? What does this mean about prayer? Is prayer somehow where we bargain with God? Is God uh, to be manipulated? Is He manipulative? Is there a formula to prayer? Uh, if then, then we can uh, force God to act or something? No, I don't believe that's what this is teaching. I believe in this story we get the raw, real prayer that Hannah prayed. I believe we get the unedited version. And yes, in those desperate times, they call for desperate measures, right? Foxhole prayers often involve us saying to God, look, we'll do anything. Just get us out of this mess. And so God invites us to pray those, Lord, if you'll just, well, then I'll prayer. It doesn't guarantee that God is going to answer our prayer the way that we think it should be answered. After all, God is God. And we have to trust in God's wisdom and knowledge and love. But God does welcome our prayers. And what Hannah does right in this moment is that even before she has a child, she completely offers her life and even the life of your future son into the hands of God. Before the prayer is ever answered, she completely puts her trust in the Lord. And 
there's a miracle that's going to come, but there's really two miracles in this story. The first one we're going to look at can be easily missed because it's not as dramatic as the second. But look with me at what happens in verses 17 and 18. Because even though Hannah's circumstances haven't changed, she still has, is barren, she still has no son, she is going to be changed. Look with me at the conversation that takes place with the priest Eli after her prayer. In that case, Eli said, Go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request that you have asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. And then she went back and began to eat again. And get this, she was no longer sad. See, the answer to Hannah's prayer, the birth of a child, was not what brought her out of the despair. Look again at the verse. After Eli prayed for God to grant her request, the Bible says this, Then she went back, and she began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. So before this encounter, remember, she wouldn't eat. She would just simply sit and weep. Um, before this encounter, she was downcast, but not anymore. It's like the whole matter was settled for her inwardly. It was almost like she took a deep spiritual breath and said, Okay, Lord, this whole situation is yours. And in fact, my future son, should you grant that desire of my heart, he's yours as well. Everything I have, everything I don't have even, everything that I will have belongs to you, Lord. And Hannah didn't know in that moment if God was going to answer her prayer, but she's transformed. She's changed. And all of this happens before she has a son. Now, as we look at the rest of the story, we're going to see that Hannah does indeed conceive a child. She has a son named Samuel. And true to what she said, she again entrusts her child to the Lord. While he was still just a little boy, Hannah returns to the tabernacle. She finds the priest Eli, and she brings young Samuel to Eli Look with me at what happens next. Verses 26 and 28 through 28. Sir, do you remember me? Hannah asked. I'm the very woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give me this boy and he has granted my request. Now I'm giving him to the Lord and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worshiped the Lord there. See, as she's done year after year, she returns to the temple to worship, but this time she brings her son Samuel and she dedicates him to the Lord for his whole life to serve God. And Samuel would indeed grow up being mentored by this priest named Eli and he will go on, Samuel will go on to become one of Israel's greatest prophets. He's the one who will go on to anoint King Saul and yes, even King David. Hannah lives the words that are found in one of Paul's letters that tells us about parenting. Remember this unmarried uh, church leader that had no children of his own but took responsibility for children around him to catch the faith and his influence in their life? Here's what he says to parents, Ephesians 6, 4. As for parents, don't provoke your children to anger, but raise them with the discipline and instruction about the Lord. See, that's what matters. To raise them in discipline and instruction about the Lord. That's what our charge is as parents and grandparents, foster parents, guardians, mentors in the faith. We are all called to raise our children in this way and to entrust them with the Lord, to the Lord. Why? Well, because faith is more caught than it is taught. Faith is more caught than it is taught. Children of all ages look to parents and adult mentors and they check us out and they want to see if our faith in Jesus Christ is real what are we passing on uh, by our very lives and the example that we model for them are we modeling what it looks like to live as a joy-filled fully devoted disciple of Jesus a relationship with Jesus uh, begins with this uh, modeling and catching it it's a good infection I've heard it described that is a relationship with Jesus we can catch it from one another well, how do we do this? The paradox of parenting is this, that when God entrusts us with a child, we are called to then entrust God with that child. When God entrusts us with a child, the paradox of parenting is that God then calls us to entrust that child back to the Lord. And look with me at our big idea 
today. We glean this from Hannah's own life because before, during, and after Samuel's birth, she entrusts her child to God. She shows that the God of heaven's armies is in charge of her life and her son's life, not her. That's why our big idea today is this. I invite God into my messy parenting when I continually entrust my children to the Lord and leverage my influence. Let me say that one more time in case you're taking notes. I invite God into my messy parenting when I continually entrust my children to the Lord and leverage my influence. See, both of these go together. Entrusting our children to the Lord doesn't mean that we don't have a vital, necessary, essential role to play. Parents, grandparents, foster parents, guardians, people of God, you have an important life to lead and a role to play in the life of a child. Yes, entrust those children to God, but don't forget to leverage your influence. For nearly 21 years, Pastor George, our lead pastor at Grace Church, has uh, served as a mentor for me as I sought to be a very imperfect father to my son, Caleb. And throughout these now two decades of conversation and me seeking advice and times of prayer for my son, uh, Pastor George helped me identify three different stages of parenting where we need to leverage our influence in different ways. Uh, the first comes when our children are very little and we play the role of a caregiving cop, <laughs> a caregiving cop. We, we provide them the essential care that a child needs to feel secure and know that they're loved and their basic needs provided for. But uh, also we have to be the cop, right? Because in those years of exploration <laughs> where they will seek to uh, put their fingers uh, in sockets and seek to run out into the street or do who knows what else in the name of exploration and curiosity as children have it. Uh, we got to be the cop there to kind of keep them uh, in bounds, if you will, and to keep them safe. Now, I know that there's some shows out there about kids saying the darndest things or kids saying funny statements, but any person that's been around a child for very long, you find yourself uttering funny statements that you never thought you'd have to say, right? I mean, uh, who would have ever thought we'd have to say, no, you can't eat the cat food or uh, no, you can't ride in the trunk or please stop licking the television or I had to ask my son, Caleb, to please stop flushing his Hot Wheels down the toilet after I learned to replace two myself because I couldn't afford a plumber. <laughs> so we have to be that caregiving cop in their life. And yes, we will say the strangest things in that stage of parenting. But as children move into adolescence, our role becomes much more uh, like a coach in that we stand on the sidelines as our children are engaged in the game of life and we're close by and we can help them on those breaks when they come to huddle up or they uh, come back to the sidelines for uh, a break. We can help them maybe see some different kind of plays to run and some different options that they have before them. We can help them see the big picture and provide them some coaching along the way. In late adolescence though, our role shifts even more because parents and mentors, we become more of a counselor for children. Kids need less and less of caregiving and less and less coaching, but they need a counselor to listen. You know, if something really matters to someone, put ears to it. Listen to your older adolescent and young adult children because you can provide a, a, a sounding board for them. You can listen, you can ask good questions and remind them of things that are true and can be trusted in their life and yes, in their faith. Ultimately, as Adults, our children join us and become fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Isn't that amazing? We move from being a caregiving cop uh, to a coach, to a counselor, to just a fellow child of God and person of worth on life's journey. Now I know, and to my mom's credit, now I know that the key in each of these stages, for me at least, has been the timing and it's also been uh, in trusting and letting go. That's been the two challenges, is to know what time, what stage am I in uh, with my son or with uh, these young people at church or in our community that we have an opportunity to reach out to? What stage uh, are their, their needs needing? And then from there is not only knowing the timing, but knowing when to let go and to enter into a new stage. And when a kid needs a counselor, we don't need to try to be a cop. And young children don't need coaches and counselors. 
They need that caregiving uh, person to help them with more direct direction and care. At Grace Church, our family ministry team has identified spiritual milestones to help mark these stages in a child's faith development and also to help parents know how they can be better equipped. So uh, we have these milestones like infant baptism at Grace Church. Uh, we have third grade Bibles that we've marked as a big opportunity for children to take the next step in, in having a firsthand faith in Jesus. And then confirmation is where they accept for themselves the promises that were made by their parents and guardians at their baptism. And that faith does become firsthand for that young adult. And then finally, our senior celebration uh, is where we gather together and launch them out into a whole new phase of adulthood where we can still be a counselor and a support system for them. But each of these help us to be spiritual champions for our children. And I know that right now, especially during this season, this can be very challenging. <laughs> There's a lot of parents right now that are exhausted and you need to give yourself a lot of grace and kindness. Um, in these days of the COVID crisis, I was delighted to see a young mom's Facebook post last week. And uh, she's got young kids at home full time and her husband's trying to work. And here's what she posted one Sunday. She said, day 35, today was just what I needed. My very wise friend told me to give the kids more screen time. So since my husband Brett uh, worked most of the day, I did and it was wonderful. After a four mile walk, we quote, went to church. I read the rest of Romans 12. I worked on scrapbooks. We ordered bonefish and played Clue with Brett's parents. It was a great end to a relaxing day. <laughs> I love reading that post because she's giving grace to herself and to her children and to her family. Uh, way to go, Mandy. So all of us need this. We need uh, to grace ourselves with the, the love of Jesus and the kindness of God. No parent gets it right all the time. Take a deep breath. Uh, grace fills in the gaps for us when we need it. And yet, we need to leverage our influence, and it can be done in just small ways. Uh, family dinners, time for family walk, uh, bedtime prayers, reading Bible stories together. All these little things can add that structure into our families' lives, even in this time of great crisis and difficulty. Well, the day my son was born, my life was, in fact, changed forever. Uh, Mom was right. Now, I know. <laughs> now I know that parenting is about entrusting our children to the Lord, and it doesn't stop. It continues. Uh, my mom has modeled this for me. Like Hannah, she continues, even today, to entrust my younger brother Brad and myself into the hands and the arms of God. And she also leverages her influence. She told me the other day, um, my brother Brad is an emergency room doctor, and she said as he leaves for work, uh, she prays for him, a prayer that she's written out, and she prays for his safety as he's around COVID cases all day for hour after hour. And she says, I have to continually entrust him to the Lord. My mom has also done this in my life. Her uh, prayers and even the scripture passage on the story of Hannah has made a big influence in my life. I asked her about it this week, and I want you to watch this brief clip of the story my mom tells. Watch this. Now I'd like to share with you why this story of Hannah in the Old Testament is so um, precious to me. In the summer of 1970, my husband graduated from seminary. I graduated from college. We moved to a new town and a new church, and I gave birth to our first child. So after six years of marriage, we were so ready to be parents. As I sat in the hospital following that delivery, I had one of the deepest spiritual experiences that I've had in my life. I just was overcome with joy and gladness and gratitude that God had given us this beautiful baby boy. And as I pondered, I thought, what what can I do to show my gratitude? I just had to say back to the Lord, oh, I just give him back to you that you will be in his life and that he will serve you all of his life. 
So when I went home and shared that experience with my husband, he said, oh, you must read the Old Testament story of Hannah and her son Samuel. So I did. And the verse says, I prayed for this child and the Lord granted me what I ask of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord. That's 1 Samuel 1, 27. So I decided that I didn't want to put pressure on Wes, so I did not share this experience with him until the day of his ordination following his seminary graduation. Then it was um, just such a rewarding experience to tell him that all along I knew he was going to serve God full time. I didn't know exactly how, but that God would be faithful and call Wes into ministry. So now I continue to just give thanks for all the faithfulness that God has given me in my life, especially on this Mother's Day. Thank you, Mom. And you heard that right. She kept that prayer hidden in her heart for over 30 years until the night of my ordination. And then she let me know that God had this plan for my life all along and had revealed it to her when I was just first born. Never underestimate the power of a parent's prayer in the life of a child. Children are full of God's love and destiny and purpose, and we get to join as a spiritual champion in their life. We do that by entrusting them to the Lord, as we saw Hannah do, and as we saw, frankly, my own mom do. And we also leverage our influence and lean in in those moments because we are looking forward to the day where we will look them in the eye and we will say to ourselves, if not out loud to them, ah, now you know. Now you know the most important thing there is to know in all of life. It's the love of God expressed through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let's pray together. Well, God, we thank you that you are a perfect heavenly parent. And Lord, we frail earthly parents come to you today first needing your grace and forgiveness. We need your help in uh, taking away the times that we have messed up and when we haven't lived into the calling that you have for our life. Thank you that your mercies are new every morning and they're new for us in this moment right now. Lord, thank you for the great privilege it is to serve as a spiritual champion for a young person. Whether that young person and child lives in our home or is in the household of faith, we thank you for this high and holy calling. And Lord, we pray that today we would know that you are our perfect parent and that you love us with an everlasting love. For anybody here that has not said yes to you and is not in a relationship with you, Lord, today, May it be a day of salvation for them where they come home to you and find your embrace. For those of us that need to take the next step, Lord, encourage us by the power of your Holy Spirit as you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.